So glad you're here yeah, at Live Lunch Break, and thank you guys for sharing it with us on the first day of June. Again, I'm Rick Coster from the day, and this is Olive, one third, but a very important one third of <laughs> Olive Tiger. And uh, Jesse and Dan are with us today. But um, watching and listening and enjoying several musical questions just kept popping <laughs> into my my brain, and so I want to prove what an idiot I am by asking a few of them. And I think. Uh, when someone plays cello at a fairly young age, I always think intuitively, well, they started playing in, in elementary school or in grade school, and then maybe the guitar. But I almost, watching you play, I almost thought she played guitar before she played cello. <laughs> Is that wrong? Um, yes and no. <laughs> I think I, I picked up a guitar before I picked up a cello, but I started actually playing the cello before actually starting to play the guitar. Okay. My my older brother is also a singer songwriter, Chris Kiley, and he's uh, so he had a guitar. Um, he's a little older than me, so he had a guitar laying around the house for um, for quite a while before I started playing. But um, I started playing cello when I was a senior in high school, actually, so fairly late in the game um, in the in the string world. But uh, I really wanted to do it, so um, I did it somehow. I got into a, a college program at Central um, for for cello, and um, so I started studying pretty intensely at that point in time. Um, but then uh, I went to grad school for music therapy, and that's when I started playing the guitar. We actually had a, a repertoire class, and our, our last, our final assignment for the class was to write a song in a style that we had studied. So that was my first songwriting experience, and the the experience of um, creating something where nothing had existed prior, and it's like now this thing exists in the world that just entirely came from your brain was was just absolutely um, an incredible experience to me. Well, uh, the, the structures that you played in those first four songs blew my mind because they're not very conventional, at least certainly not in a pop songwriting context. And the first thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, at least as far as the guitar is concerned, is uh, the left hand chord voicings and patterns just aren't what I normally associate. Uh, you went to school and studied cello. Are you self-taught on guitar? Well, um, I took some classes uh, like group, like group guitar classes in school. Um, so, uh, but I think by that point, I, I was able to skip like the very beginning guitar class because I knew like all the basic chords and stuff because my brother having the guitar around the house. So, um, so up until that point, I was like more or less self-taught. But I, I learned a couple things in the classes. It was yeah. good. <laughs> and you also shift your rhythm patterns quite a lot in the middle of a song. Is there someone that you listened to as a kid, a songwriter that made you think like that, or is this just all coming out of your feverish brain? <laughs> um, I'm I'm sure I, I'm sure I must have uh, been listening to some people growing up that that did that, but um, I'm trying to think of who I listen to now that that does it a lot. Um, bands like the Dodos do that pretty frequently, where like the the rhythm kind of stays constant, but the the way that they like play with that rhythm changes. Right. Um, so I, I really like that a lot. When when as a listener, when you're listening to a song and it takes a sudden turn, but the you know, but you're still able to like catch it easily, you know. Right. Um. It's also much easier as a songwriter too. If I have a snippet that I'm like, oh, this snippet sounds like it could go with that snippet, then I can kind of like you know put them together like a puzzle and uh, make this, and then the song becomes much more interesting than it would have been if I had just expanded on that one idea. Do you find that you write differently if you're writing on cello than you do guitar, or does a melody or even a lyrical concept occur to you and you think, well, this would be better suited if I worked from a cello perspective, or you got a method? <laughs> Um, it's yeah. The method varies depending on the tune. Actually, like sometimes, um, sometimes I write a song and I and um, there's a particular concept that I'm trying to play with. Or um, like I remember at one point in time I was like, I I want to write a song that had the song before the last one when I had written that one. That one's actually pretty old. But when I had first written it, I was like, I want to write a song that has like a long chord progression. Like I just wanted the chord, the progression to be like long and just <laughs> repeating. So like you know, so that started there. But um, but a lot of times you write it does come from like a little snippet of something and, and um, so then at that point I have to decide if it's better suited for the guitar or for the cello. Um, they, I mean they, they each have different things that they can do. I think the guitar has um, a much wider range of um, colors that you can do outside of a loop right, context. Right. 
Um, but the, the being able to create those colors was part of why I brought the loop into the mix, the looper. Um, as Olive said, the album comes out July 8th from Telegraph Records. Um, when you were recording, uh, and again, typically Olive would be with, with two other musicians that do a surprising array of percussion and electronic and classical elements to it. How does it change the context of what you're doing right now without them? <laughs> um. It's kind of nerve-wracking to play without them, actually. Oh, you don't seem, you seem very them. sure. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, I don't know. I think um, personally, when I play, uh, I, I sort of um, I ha my brain doesn't have enough space to compute that there's people watching at the same time as like computing what I'm doing. Um, no offense or anything. I love you guys, but <laughs> um, uh, but I, I think that also happens within the full band context. But in you know when when the guys are with me, we can. Um, I think my my bubble is slightly expanded to include them, but um, uh, yeah, it feels it feels different. I, I mean, I have a hard time as a performer in general, just like feeling natural, like playing in front of an audience. So like the way that I deal with that is to you know just I don't know. There's that old thing to like pretend like the audience is in their underwear, and I don't really do that, but I just like pretend like you're not here. <laughs> and I'd like to say on behalf of all of that all of you guys have great underwear. Just kidding. Um, the second tune you did. Well, you were uh, talking about, you know, going down to your your way yes, before. Yes, because it's hot in here. And I, <laughs> I wore, it, was, it was cold when I got up. But. Yeah, we've already explored the subject of getting in our underwear for this show. So. <laughs> uh, the second tune you did, when you were looping off of the cello, you went, at the end of the song, and by the way, that was just magnificent. How long could you, could you have added three and four part vocal harmonies and just kept going if you wanted to, for example, or do you ever do that or is it, you gotta stick with the structure? Or? Yeah, I do. I, I'm really, um, I, I think with the looper, uh, part, of, part of the temptation with the looper is that you can go on forever <laughs> and you can get totally lost in it as a musician and you can totally lose your audience in the process. So um, I try to be mindful of that, but um, also I try to use the looper in like a structured kind of way. Um, because uh, you know, I'm still ultimately trying to write a song, and, and um, I mean, if if the I, I certainly do have songs where you know the loop is going. I'll, I'll play another one later that where the loop is um, you know running the whole time and just building and building. But um, it's a it's kind of a different approach. So it's it's different for each song as to like how long the loop is, loop is going to run and what's going to be built over that. And um, I don't have it with me today, but just recently. Um, we started incorporating um, MIDI loops in, in, in the computer, right. um, which is pretty great because it, um, it allows us to separate the loops and so I can like lay one thing and then it can go away and then it can come back later. Whereas um, I, I love this looper, but unfortunately it's kind of like the, the kind of thing where you can lay one loop, um, but you can't like undo anything and you can't like separate any of the loops within, you know, there's just one right. and you can build on top of it as many you can turn it on and off. You can put it backwards, but it's still just going to be that one loop. Well, I mean, you have clear. I, there's always going to be more technology that one has to master and <laughs> take advantage of it. It sounds terrific. That's true. And I wanted to ask you one last question, and then I'll shut up because I know we would all prefer to be listening to you perform. But I'm, I'm fascinated. In the cello piece, towards the end, you started doing these sort of runs that had uh, a lot of sustains, a lot of dissonance, almost into feedback, and I wondered. Is that something that one understands or pursues in a classical trained program, or were you listening to like King Crimson or other <laughs> bands that explore that sort of thing in a classical slash rock context? Um, no, I, um, I I totally trudged through my classical training. Um, it was it was it was definitely. Um, I I mean, I wanted to play the cello, and I loved the sound of the cello, but. Um, uh, studying classical music takes a lot of patience and a lot of um, uh, yeah a lot of patience and it wasn't um, creatively engaging enough because in classical music it's written on the page like how loud each section is supposed to be and like you know there, there's like a, a specific way to play it so it, um, I think for at least for me um, classical training was very good to um, uh, to start to um, explore different textures that you can use and you know to for learning the technical side of things but um, I, I, I wasn't 
very good at studying and, and <laughs> I wasn't very good at practicing actually even um, while I was while I was learning because I kind of had like musical ADD so I'd go from um, you know before I even picked up the cello the reason I didn't start until I was 17 was because before that I was playing the piano and the flute and this and that and, and switching around instruments so many times so um, yeah well, thank you so much for being but here again. I don't think I actually answered your question, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that song has never actually come out particularly that way. Um, and, you know, every time I'm playing solo, it, it kind of takes a different turn and, and sounds uh, slightly different. So um, usually I just do one vocal loop in the beginning. But I don't know, at that moment, I didn't feel like I wanted them to run the whole time. So then I put the ooze down in the beginning. And then the mic was turned up. Regarding the feedback, the mic was just turned up too high. So <laughs> it was such a great effect. It was totally on purpose, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for being here. This is Olive Tiger. I will now shut up and you would grace us with a few more tunes. Thank you guys for being with us on live lunch break and here's Olive. Um, this next tune I'm gonna play is actually a, a song that's the, um, the title track for the record, which is called Until My Body Breaks. Um, and uh, yeah, hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 